Right. We're going to start with our first keynote speaker this morning, and we are very, very fortunate to have Professor Andrew Channon. Now, some of you might have known him as Associate Professor. Oh, no longer. It is now Professor Channon. And Professor Channon is going to be speaking to us about equity and action for borderline personality disorder. Can you help me in welcoming, please, Professor Andrew Channon? Okay, well, thank you very much. Sorry about the delay. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, uh, the organisers for uh, inviting me to uh, present to you today. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, I particularly wanted to uh, also acknowledge uh, Auntie Joy's uh, welcome and uh, also to acknowledge the uh, Wurundjeri people, uh, their elders past and present. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I, I particularly would like to thank Jan as well uh, because uh, many of you will uh, have heard already that she's been a tireless campaigner, but it's not just about symbolism. It's uh, also about uh, action and outcomes, which is what I'm uh, hoping to talk to you about. Uh, and uh, we can all really thank Jan for the National BPD guidelines, as well as uh, uh, the previous uh, ministerial expert reference group, uh, along with uh, a lot of the impetus behind uh, the day that you see here uh, today. So thank you very much, Jan. Um, just to let you know, I have uh, no conflict of interest to declare. And there are many other people that uh, I would like to, uh, to acknowledge, uh, but particularly Louise McCutcheon, who's uh, been my co-pilot in the work that we've done for uh, uh, 17 years now, uh, and uh, many of the other people that you can uh, see on the screen, and also the patients and families of the program that I run who've really taught us most of what we know about borderline personality disorder. Um, I also uh, want to just give you a little bit of a warning. I'm going to, uh, now that I, I am a professor, I, I, all my professors when I was uh, 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 being uh, uh, a student were, um, would go on rants about various things and I figure it's finally my turn. So um, I hope that, uh, it says preaching to the choir since 1846. I hope I am preaching to the choir, but I am going to say a few things uh, that I think, um, I, I hope to stir you up a bit about uh, what your uh, assumptions are about BPD and how we all might approach this uh, as a problem. BPD is, uh, is really unique in that, uh, in that mental health, as we all know, is uh, fighting for uh, appropriate recognition among uh, health priorities. Uh, my organisation, Origin Youth Health, has been central in that campaign. Uh, we know that it accounts for about 13% of the uh, health burden but only receives about 6% of the health funding. What singles out borderline personality disorder is that even within mental health, it's fighting for recognition. That it lacks legitimacy uh, as a, a diagnosis, as a disorder, as a concern for the field in the same way that uh, um, uh, 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 fellow uh, groups that are concerned with uh, problems like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder uh, can approach uh, politicians and approach funding bodies with confidence that at least the basics of recognition are established. What we know about BPD and what you'll hear I'm sure from other speakers today is that it is a common disorder. We often talk about community prevalence uh, of the disorder and it's about uh, around about 1% overall in the population. It's higher in young people, around about 3%. But I don't think that tells the true story. The true story is that already in mental health services, one in five people has borderline personality disorder, and even more have sub-threshold features of the disorder. We know that it's associated with chronic disturbances in interpersonal relationships, uh, and uh, in uh, vocational and educational poor outcomes. You'll hear from people that this is a good outcome disorder. Symptomatically, yes, but functionally, no. And we have to be honest about that, that people with BPD uh, still uh, lack the, the um, uh, recovery trajectory that we would hope, uh, uh, and that we are still uh, less than competent at helping them get there. Uh, in order to facilitate what is a meaningful life for them rather than a symptom-free life. 
We also know that BPD is a stronger predictor of being on the disability pension than uh, mood or anxiety disorders, yet it's something that politicians really don't know about, even though they're terribly concerned about uh, uh, the DSP at the moment. And one of the untold uh, um, uh, outcomes and one of the tragedies of this disorder is the poor physical health endured by people with borderline personality disorder. And ultimately the worst tragedy is that about 8 to 10 per cent will die by suicide and when it is measured up to one third of suicides are accounted for by people with BPD or BPD features. Some of you will be familiar with uh, the Tolkien report, which Gavin Andrews uh, published uh, um, uh, two iterations of. This is from Tolkien 2. And what this slide shows us <clears throat> is that BPD is as costly to treat as bipolar disorder and uh, anorexia nervosa. And yet uh, it's a low priority for uh, health policy planning. What it also tells us is that when health policy is developed, that it's seen as acceptable to only have 30% coverage of the population of people with borderline personality disorder. And if you look at all the other figures in that column, you can see that it's more acceptable to have 70% cover for depression, uh, anxiety disorders, uh, and uh, most of the other major mental disorders. Borderline personality disorder is still fighting for recognition and for coverage uh, as one of the serious and severe mental health problems. Here's where I get a bit cantankerous. Because I think that actually clinicians and clinical services are among the greatest barriers to equ equity and action for borderline personality disorder. This is not a problem of the community. It's not necessarily a problem even of politicians. Ignorance is, might be a problem, but uh, uh, clinicians and clinical services get in the way of recovery from borderline personality disorder and sadly, on many occasions, harm people with borderline personality disorder. And we need to be uh, realistic and honest about that. We also need to acknowledge there are many centres of excellence and uh, uh, there are many people doing very good work. So this is not to run down those people working hard, but to acknowledge that the general system not only poorly caters for, but often harms people with the disorder. This says, good news. The test results show that it's a metaphor. So <laughs> although I've just had a go at people, <clears throat> I do think we need to uh, acknowledge that treatment is effective and that, uh, and, and Satya Rao I know is going to talk later about uh, effective treatment, uh, and that is a good news story. So what are the barriers to equity and action for borderline personality disorder? There are many basic things. We know that the diagnosis is infrequently recorded. Uh, we know that it's seen as illegitimate in many health systems. And we know that receiving a diagnosis of BPD often means that people are either excluded from inpatient care, services, and in the inter international uh, uh, scene, uh, from insurance coverage. We know that treatment isn't always helpful, and we know that bad treatment is probably worse than no treatment. That people with BPD, when uh, uh, mishandled or uh, uh, when uh, subject to the vagaries of the uh, health system, end up with long durations of illness, <clears throat> polypharmacy, that is receiving multiple medications with dubious indications, uh, and suffering recurrent uh, and chronic uh, common mental disorders such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety disorders. And then there's all the other associated lifestyle factors, smoking, substance use, uh, poor physical health, uh, poor diet, all these other problems that are attendant with borderline personality disorder. We also know that there is a failure, and this has been particularly a passion of mine, of early diagnosis of the disorder, lack of early intervention services, 
and a head in the sand approach to BPD in young people. And the message that I've returned to over and over again is that if it looks like a duck and if it swims like a duck and if it quacks like a duck, <clears throat> then we have to at least consider the possibility that we have a small aquatic bird of the family Anatidae on our hands. <laughs> it might not be borderline personality disorder, but it's damn well likely to be. But we need to recognise borderline personality disorder is a moving target. That it is a disorder that changes across the life course. It is not a life sentence. And that symptomatic recovery is actually a natural part of the disorder. Regardless of treatment, people with BPD will get better symptomatically. But that's not the ball to keep our eye on. The ball to keep our eye on is functional recovery. That is vocational, interpersonal uh, recovery. And we know from the best quality data that only about 50% of people with BPD will achieve that. So we need to stop this head in the sand approach to early diagnosis and early intervention. And we need to recognise that late intervention, which is our standard care at the moment, uh, means that patients are excluded from care until they can no longer be ignored. And even then, some are excluded still. We know that there is a failure in the health system to make empirically supported treatments widely or easily available. And we know there's this continued engagement in parlour games in things that are terribly interesting to clinicians but don't really change the lives of individuals with borderline personality disorder, arguments about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. We also know in the research community that BPD suffers. When I began my career in BPD research, uh, a, a very esteemed uh, American colleague said to me, keep going because when I started this work, people told me that it was professional suicide to go into BPD research. Uh, and I've hung on to those words ever since. Uh, it, it hasn't been professional suicide and it's been a very rewarding uh, area to work in. But it's incredibly difficult to persuade people to uh, take on a career in BPD research when uh, the, the work involved in uh, collaborating with patients, in doing the research, is, is so much more difficult because of the nature of the disorder itself. But that shouldn't stop us studying disorders just because they're difficult, uh, just because they have problems. We know that there was a deliberate decision to exclude BPD from the glo second global burden of disease study. And as a result, despite the fact that in the first Global Burden of Disease study, self-inflicted injury was among the top 10 contributors to disability-adjusted life years in the world. And we know that as a result of not being measured, <clears throat> we'd have no data now about disability on a global perspective in relation to BPD. BPD was included, or PDs were included in the first national survey of mental health and wellbeing, but again, were excluded from the second uh, survey. And if it's not measured, we won't get a seat at the table. We need to encourage people to do so. But we shouldn't look outside, we should also look at ourselves. We're not blameless. We often fail to stand up to bigoted colleagues who discriminate against people with BPD. We often suffer the soft bigotry of low expectations, that we don't expect people with BPD to recover, that we don't expect them to be able to uh, make use of treatment or uh, to be able to have uh, lives that, uh, uh, that they value. Uh, and these problems beset the clinical community and hold us back from helping people to achieve positive and realistic outcomes. We have our own fear of labelling. What happens if we make the diagnosis? What will our colleagues do? What will they think of us? We have an excessive focus on past trauma at the expense of facilitating change, and we see the two as inextricably linked. And we have too little focus on current traumas that reduce the likelihood of recovery, particularly things like adult sexual assault, which is a potent predictor of non-recovery from BPD. This is not just about childhood sexual abuse. It's not just about childhood adversity more broadly. 
We don't give enough attention to the proximal things, the things that are happening in the lives of individuals with BPD right now, uh, compared with uh, our um, excessive attention on what is a, a, a terrible harm in the community, but one of the things that uh, is a fixed uh, exposure to problems, one of the things that people need to incorporate into treatment and help people to come to terms with, but an event that cannot be changed. We take our eye off the ball of so many events that can be changed. The terrible traumas that are suffered at the hands of uh, mental health systems uh, and uh, the uh, community uh, at large uh, are often ignored or underplayed uh, and they need to be part of the picture as well. Because these transitions, these changes, uh, can alter the course of psychopathology and influence uh, the outcome of BPD. And we shouldn't assume that the determinants of mental health are invariant across the lifespan. They do change. We also have too little focus on physical health and lifestyle factors. Safe sex, contraception, smoking, cardiovascular disease, gastrointestinal disease, rheumatological diseases, these are all higher among people with borderline personality disorder. And again, this is a hot topic in the field, physical health of people with BPD. And we have an excessive devotion often to outmoded theories way beyond their use by date and to treatments way beyond their use by date when the evidence shows us they're wrong or they don't work. And we also have an excessive focus on staff needs over patient needs. And we often dress up our own needs as clinicians as if they are the needs of uh, patients. So how can we change? Your voices are the greatest strength that we have. We need support from clinicians and researchers, but consumers and carers need to lead the fight for borderline personality disorder. They're, you are the most potent voice. You are the people that politicians listen to. You are the people that funding bodies listen to. And your voice speaks louder than any uh, 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 academic or uh, clinician can ever speak. We need to challenge bigots by using the diagnosis and defending its use. The onus of proof should actually be on the bigots. We should ask them what evidence they have to support their outmoded views. Our primary focus should also be on patient needs while not ignoring staff needs. Working in the field is certainly challenging and it's not for the faint hearted. But we need to keep our focus on patients, not on staff and institutional needs. And we need to be open-minded. We all need to change in the face of the evidence. We also need to acknowledge our limitations. We need to say what we can and we can't do, and when we can't, we need to stop pretending without losing hope. And we need to involve carers, not exclude them, in the recovery of people with borderline personality disorder. And importantly, and uh, I credit Jan with this message, we need to give patients choice. To paraphrase Henry Ford, you know, you can have every, any colour as long as it's black. Uh, a, a, a health system response to BPD is not to say you can have every, any treatment as long as it's DBT. We need to develop a health system response to borderline personality disorder. Starting right at the top with those with temperamental vulnerability and leading down to the pointy end there of people who have the disorder itself. And to expand on the pointy end to actually offer generic brief interventions and crisis management for the broader group of people with BPD who will never see the inside of a therapist's office. And we need to preserve our specialist therapies as we do renal transplantation and coronary care units for the people who need them most. We need a coordinated response to BPD. We need to develop core competencies for the clinical workforce, and we need to distill what are the necessary elements for effective intervention for BPD, because these are actually much less complex than previously imagined. Treatment of BPD is not rocket science, and it's been way oversold in terms of its complexity. 
But we do need to understand, uh, uh, better understand what constitutes effective treatment and what are the underlying abnormal biological and psychological or psychosocial processes that lead to BPD. This says it's not enough that, that we, uh, sorry, it's not enough that we succeed, cats must fail. And we need to stop the infighting. We need to stop the brand wars. Satcher is going to tell you that most, if most treatments are, if, that are based on an understanding of BPD are effective. And we need to stop the uh, infighting about my brand of soap powder is better than yours. We need to define research priorities, better defining the phenotype, what is BPD, in children, young people and adults. We need to understand the genetic and environmental influences on the etiology and development of the disorder, and we need to capitalise on advances in neuroscience in our quest to understand the disorder. But most importantly, we need action to improve the lives of individuals with BPD and those who care for them, instead of this preoccupation with brand name therapies, which has obscured the exploration and identification of the effective elements of intervention. So to conclude, BPD needs a seat at the table in terms of policy, clinical services and research. We can no longer endure bigotry and silence and we need to ask the naysayers and cynics to produce evidence to support their position. And we need to build a health system response to BPD with consumers and carers at its focus rather than the marketing of individual psychotherapies. So in finishing, I'd just like to plug an advertisement for the next International Borderline Conference, uh, sorry, International Personality Disorder Conference, which is in Montreal next year. And uh, I hope that those of you who are interested will, will come. Uh, there will be a uh, special rate for consumers and carers, and uh, we hope to uh, uh, see some of you there. So thank you very much for your attention. Just while Professor Channon unplugs, um, as a carer and a consumer, vice versa, it doesn't matter. I had moments where I felt I was dreaming. Did anyone else? This was a clinical keynote, and yet it spoke to the heart of what many of us as consumers and carers have been endorsing or trying to get the message across. So uh, have you jumped to the other side? I love it, I love it. Okay, can we please thank Professor Anna Drew Channon.